little fox. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter Seven: Trouble at School. In September, when Anne started school, Marilla was worried. Anne was a strange girl. How would she make friends? How would she stay quiet in the classroom? But after her first day, Anne came home excited and happy. I like school, Anne declared. I don't like the teacher, Mr. Phillips, though. He said my spelling was terrible and held it up for everybody to see. Anne, don't say that about your teacher. I hope you were a good girl," said Marilla. "I was," answered Anne. "I sit with Diana near the window, and we can see the lake of shining waters. I am in a lower class than Diana, though. She is on the fifth book, and I am on the fourth book. There are many nice girls in school, and we had fun playing at lunchtime. And Jane Andrews told Ruby Gillis she heard Minnie McPherson say that I had a pretty nose. That is the first compliment I have ever had in my life, Marilla. Do I have a pretty nose? I know you'll tell me the truth. Your nose is all right, Marilla said. Secretly, she thought that Anne's nose was remarkably pretty, but Marilla had no intention of telling her so. Three weeks passed. And Anne and Diana were walking to school one morning. Gilbert Blythe will be in school today," said Diana. "He's been away at his cousin's. He's so handsome, Anne, and he teases the girls terribly." From Diana's voice, it was clear that Diana liked being teased by Gilbert Blythe. "Gilbert's in your class," Diana went on. "He's on the fourth book because he missed school when his father was sick. He's usually at the top of the class, though." You're at the top of the class now, Anne. I'm glad Gilbert is coming back," said Anne. "I don't feel proud about being at the top of a class with little boys and girls who are only nine years old." The girls went into the classroom. "That's Gilbert Blythe sitting across from you, Anne," said Diana. "Isn't he handsome?" Anne looked. She had lots of time to look because Gilbert was busy tying Ruby Gillis's long golden braid to her chair. Gilbert was a tall boy with curly brown hair and a cheeky smile. When Ruby Gillis tried to stand up, she <gasps> fell back screaming, thinking that her hair was being pulled out. Everybody stared at her, and she started to cry. Gilbert read his book and looked very serious. But when everyone was quiet again, he looked at Anne and winked at her. "I think your Gilbert Blythe is handsome," whispered Anne to Diana. But he's very bold. It isn't polite to wink at a girl he doesn't know. In the afternoon, Gilbert tried to get Anne's attention again. Mr. Phillips, the teacher, was in the back of the room explaining math to an older girl. The other students were drawing pictures on their slates, eating apples, whispering, or playing with some crickets. Gilbert Blythe tried to make Anne look at him without success. Anne stared out the window at the lake of shining waters, lost in her own world. Usually, girls did look at Gilbert. He thought that red-headed Shirley girl should look at me. He reached across the aisle and grabbed the end of Anne's long red braid. He held it out and said in a loud whisper, "Carrots, carrots!" This time, Anne did look at him, and she did more than look. She jumped up and stared fiercely at Gilbert. "You mean, hateful boy!" she shouted. "How dare you!" And then, whack! Anne cracked her slate on Gilbert's head. The students at Avonlea School always enjoyed a scene, and this was an especially good one. Diana gasped. Ruby Gillis began to cry again. Mr. Phillips stalked to the front of the classroom. Anne Shirley, what happened just now? He said angrily. Anne did not answer. It was too embarrassing to tell everybody that Gilbert had called her carrots. Gilbert spoke. It was my fault. I teased her. He admitted. Mr. Phillips ignored Gilbert. Anne, stand in front of the board for the rest of the afternoon. He told her. With a pale, stony face, Anne obeyed. Mr. Phillips wrote on the board above her head, 
Anne Shirley has a very bad temper. Anne Shirley must control her temper. Then the teacher read the words aloud so that everybody, even the youngest children who could not read, understood. Anne stood there all afternoon. She didn't cry because she was still angry. Anne thought, I'll never speak to Gilbert Blythe again. When school finally ended, Anne marched out and waited for Diana on the porch. Gilbert approached her. Sorry I teased you, Anne, he whispered. I'm really sorry. Anne ignored him. Gilbert put a candy that said, You are sweet, on the ledge near Anne. Anne picked it up carefully, dropped it on the floor, and ground it into a fine powder under her shoe. Then she started walking. Oh, Anne, said Diana. How could you ignore his apology? I will never forgive Gilbert Blythe, Anne retorted furiously. And Mr. Phillips spelled my name without an E. Gilbert teases all the girls, Anne, Diana said. He laughs at my hair because it's so black and calls me crow. He's never said sorry to any girl before today. There's a big difference between crow and carrots, Diana, Anne said with a sniff. The next day at school, Mr. Phillips' mood had not improved. He spotted Anne talking to Charlie Sloan. Anne Shirley, since you like boys so much, you will sit with Gilbert Blythe, said Mr. Phillips. The other boys laughed. Anne did not move. Anne, obey me at once, the teacher said. For a moment, it seemed Anne would never move. But at last, she got up, sat down beside Gilbert, and buried her face in her arms on the desk. To sit next to a boy was bad enough, but to sit next to Gilbert Blythe was unbearable. When school ended, Anne picked up everything from her desk, all her books, her pen and ink, and piled them onto her cracked slate. Why are you taking everything home, Anne? Diana asked. I'm not coming to school anymore, said Anne. When Anne got home, she told Marilla she had finished school forever. Nonsense, said Marilla. Marilla, I've been insulted. You'll go tomorrow, was Marilla's answer. Oh, no, said Anne. I'm not going back. I'll study at home. Marilla knew Anne was stubborn, and so she let Anne study at home, for the time being. She hoped that Anne would miss her schoolmates and return to school soon. But it is Anne, Marilla acknowledged with a sigh. So anything could happen. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter 8, Diana Makes a Special Visit One beautiful October morning, Marilla and Anne sat in the kitchen and cut vegetables. Anne, Marilla began, why don't you ask Diana to come over for afternoon tea? I am going into town, and she can come then. Oh, Marilla! Anne clasped her hands. How perfectly lovely! We will be like grown-ups. Can we use the teapot with the roses? No, but I have some cake and raspberry cordial in the pantry you can have, Marilla replied. Diana came over, dressed in her second-best dress. Anne, dressed in her own second-best dress, opened the door with a very serious expression. Together, they went to the front room. How is your mother? Anne asked politely, like an adult. She is very well, thank you. And Mr. Cuthbert is in the potato fields? Asked Diana. Yes, he is. Our potatoes are very good this year, replied Anne. Abruptly, her tone changed. Oh, Diana! She burst out. Let's go and pick some apples. The girls instantly stopped acting like proper ladies and ran outside to the apple orchard. Marilla said we can pick the rest of the apples, said Anne. Marilla is very kind. She also said we can have cake and raspberry cordial for tea. I love red drinks. They just taste better, don't they? Later, the girls went inside, and Anne went to the pantry to get the raspberry cordial. At first, she couldn't see it anywhere. 
but then she spotted it at the back. Anne put the cordial on the table with a big glass. Please help yourself, Diana. I can't drink a thing after eating all those apples. Diana poured herself some of the drink and sipped it. This is a very nice cordial, Anne, she said. I didn't know cordial tasted so good. I'm glad you like it, Anne replied. Take as much as you want. I'll get the cake. When Anne came back, Diana was drinking a second glass of cordial. Diana started to drink a third glass, and Anne didn't mind. It's the nicest cordial I ever drank, said Diana. It's much nicer than Mrs. Lynn's cordial. It doesn't taste a bit like hers. I'm sure Marilla's cordial is nicer than Mrs. Lynn's, said Anne loyally. Marilla is a famous cook. She's trying to teach me, but it's hard work, Diana. Last week, Anne continued, Marilla told me to put some pudding sauce in the pantry and cover it. I took the bowl of sauce into the pantry, but I forgot to cover it. I remembered the next morning and ran to the pantry. Diana, a mouse had drowned in the sauce. I used a spoon to get the mouse and took it outside. Then I was going to tell Marilla about the mouse, but I started pretending I was a forest fairy flying through the trees, and I forgot about the mouse and the sauce. After that, Mr. and Mrs. Ross came for lunch. We ate lunch, and everything was fine until I saw Marilla coming in with plum pudding and pudding sauce warmed up. I remembered everything and shouted, "Marilla, don't use the sauce! A mouse drowned in it!" Mr. and Mrs. Ross looked at me, and I thought I would die. Why, Diana? Anne said suddenly, "What's the matter?" Diana stood up and then sat down. Putting her hands to her head, I'm, I'm very sick," she said. "I,、uh, I must go home." "No, don't go yet. You must eat some cake first." "I must go home," Diana repeated. "Where do you feel bad?" Anne asked. "I'm very dizzy," said Diana. Anne was very disappointed, but she took Diana to the berries fence. The next day, Marilla sent Anne to Mrs. Lynde's house on an errand. In a short space of time, Anne came flying back to Green Gables in tears. "What's the matter, Anne?" Marilla said. "Mrs. Lynde saw Diana's mother today. Mrs. Barry said that I sent Diana home drunk, and she said I was a very wicked girl, and she's never, never going to let Diana play with me again." Diana was drunk. Marilla was stunned. Anne, are you or Mrs. Barry crazy? What did you give her? Nothing but raspberry cordial. Anne said. I never thought it made you drunk. Not even if you drink three glasses like Diana did. Marilla marched to the pantry. On the shelf was a bottle of homemade wine. At that moment. Marilla remembered that the cordial was in the cellar and not the pantry, as she had told Anne. Marilla went back into the kitchen. Anne, you gave Diana wine instead of cordial. Don't you know the difference between them? I didn't taste the drink," said Anne. "Only Diana drank it, and then Diana got so sick and went home." Mrs. Barry said Diana just laughed and laughed and then slept for hours and had a headache all day. Her mother smelled her breath and knew she was drunk. Three glasses of cordial would make you sick, Marilla said, troubled. But it was an accident, Anne. So don't worry. I'll talk to Mrs. Barry. At that, Marilla left. When she came back later, she was frowning. Was Mrs. Barry still angry? Asked Anne. Mrs. Barry snapped Marilla. I told her it was a mistake, but she didn't believe me. So I told her that if my girl was so greedy, drinking three glasses of anything, I'd be punishing her. Marilla went into the kitchen. Anne stepped outside, and she walked determinedly to the Barrys' house and knocked on the door. When Mrs. Barry saw it was Anne, she frowned. What do you want? She demanded. Anne clasped her hands. Oh, Mrs. Barry, please forgive me. 
I did not mean to... to make Diana... drunk. How could I? She is my best friend in the world. I thought it was Raspberry Cordial. Please say that you'll let me play with Diana. If I can't play with her, my life will be covered by a huge dark cloud of sadness. Anne's dramatic plea had no effect on Mrs. Barry. She said coldly, Anne, you should go home. You are not a good friend for Diana. Can't I see Diana and just say one last goodbye? Anne asked. Diana is out with her father, said Mrs. Barry, shutting the door. Anne walked back to Green Gables with her head down. My last hope is gone, she told Marilla, full of despair. I talked to Mrs. Barry, and she treated me very badly. I can do nothing now but pray. But I don't think that will help because even God can't change Mrs. Barry's mind. Anne, don't talk like that said Marilla, trying not to laugh at Anne's theatrics. But later, Marilla couldn't help feeling pity for Anne when she saw that the child had cried herself to sleep. Poor little thing, Marilla whispered, kissing Anne's red cheek. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter 9 and to the rescue. Anne had been doing her lessons at home. One morning, however, Anne came into the kitchen with her school books and announced, Marilla, I'm going back to school. I miss spending time with my best friend Diana, so I must return. Marilla hid her delight well. I hope you'll behave yourself was all she said. In January, the Canadian premier toured Canada, including Prince Edward Island. Most of Avonlea supported the premier's politics, and many people, including Marilla and Mrs. Lind, went to hear him speak in Charlottetown. They planned to return to Green Gables the next day, so Anne and Matthew had the cheerful, warm kitchen of Green Gables to themselves. Matthew, did you ever study geometry? asked Anne. Well, no, I didn't, Matthew said. I wish you had, Anne said, because then you could sympathize. I'm terrible at it. Suddenly, the kitchen door flung open, and Diana Barry ran in. What's the matter, Diana? cried Anne. Has your mother changed her mind? Can we be friends again? Oh, Anne, come quickly, Diana urged her. My little sister, Minnie Mae, is awfully sick. She's got croup. Father and mother are in town at the premier's meeting, and there's nobody to get the doctor. The babysitter doesn't know what to do, and I'm so scared. Matthew reached for his cap and went outside to get the horse. Matthew will ride to Carmody for the doctor, said Anne. She quickly put on her coat. Don't cry, Diana, she went on cheerfully. I know exactly what to do for croup. Mrs. Hammond had twins three times, which gave me lots of experience because they all had croup regularly. I'll get the Ipecac bottle in case you don't have any. Come on! The two girls hurried to the Berry's house through the fields, for the snow was too deep to go the shorter way. Although Anne was sincerely worried about Minnie Mae, she was delighted to be spending time with Diana again outside of school. She thought it was truly wonderful to walk through the dark, snowy night with her best friend. At the Berries, Minnie Mae was feverish and restless, and her hoarse breathing rattled through the whole house. Anne promptly went to work. Minnie Mae has croup, all right. She's pretty bad, but I've seen worse. First, we must have lots of hot water. Diana, fill up the kettle and put some wood in the stove. I'll undress Minnie Mae and give her some Ipecac. The little girl did not take kindly to the Ipecac, but Anne kept trying. She gave Minnie the Ipecac many times during the long, anxious night, but Minnie got worse. Anne thought Minnie was sicker than the Hammond twins ever were. It was difficult for Minnie to breathe, and it seemed like she could choke to death. 
Anne, losing hope, gave her the last drop of Ipecac. In a few minutes, Minnie coughed up phlegm and began to get better right away. She soon fell asleep. It was three o'clock when Matthew finally arrived with the doctor. I nearly gave up, Anne said to the doctor. You can't imagine my relief when she finally seemed better. The doctor nodded and went to check on Minnie. Anne was exhausted from no sleep, and she went home with Matthew. In the morning, Mr. and Mrs. Barry came home. The doctor, Diana, and Minnie were in the living room. The doctor told Mr. and Mrs. Barry, That red-headed girl is a clever thing. I tell you, she saved that baby's life. For someone her age, she was smart and calm. It was wonderful. I've never seen anything like it. Anne didn't wake up until the evening of the next day. She went to the kitchen where Marilla sat knitting. Anne, Marilla said, Matthew told me about last night. It's very fortunate you knew what to do. I wouldn't have any idea myself, for I never saw a case of croup. Mrs. Barry was here this afternoon, Anne, Marilla continued. She wanted to see you, but you were sleeping. She says you saved Minnie May's life, and she's sorry she acted the way she did in the affair with the wine. She hopes you'll forgive her and be good friends with Diana again. You can go over there this evening if you like. Now, Anne, don't fly into the air. The warning was needed because Anne instantly sprang to her feet. Oh, Marilla, can I go and see Diana right now without washing my dishes? I'll wash them when I come back. I can't do something so unromantic as dishwashing at this thrilling moment. Yes, yes, run along, said Marilla indulgently, smiling. Anne ran through the orchard to the berries, not caring about the wind or cold. Mrs. Berry kissed her and cried and said she was sorry and that she could never repay Anne. Anne was embarrassed but replied politely. I forgive you, Mrs. Berry. I can tell you again that I did not mean to make Diana drunk. Diana and Anne had a lovely afternoon. Diana showed Anne a new crochet stitch her aunt had taught her. Then Diana gave Anne a beautiful card with a wreath of roses on it and a verse of poetry. If you love me as I love you, nothing but death can part us two. At school, Diana and Anne sat together again, and they were the happiest girls in Avonlea. Anne of Green Gables, Chapter 10 a late night surprise. Marilla, can I go over and see Diana just for a minute? Asked Anne. I don't want you going out after dark, said Marilla. But she has something important to tell me, cried Anne. How do you know? Because she just signaled me from her window. We make flashes with the candle by waving cardboard in front. It was my idea, Marilla. That doesn't surprise me, Anne, Marilla replied. Anne dashed over to Diana's and dashed back. Oh, Marilla, you know that tomorrow is Diana's birthday? Well, she asked me to stay at her house in the guest room. Her cousins are coming with a big sleigh, and we are all going to the debating club concert. If you'll let me go, that is. You will, won't you? No, you can't go. Little girls should not go to concerts at night, Marilla said. Anne, with tears rolling down her cheeks, went upstairs. Meanwhile, Matthew slept on the sofa. Matthew opened his eyes and said, Marilla, I think Anne should go to the concert. He had not been asleep. Well, I don't, snorted Marilla. Who's bringing up Anne, you or me? You are, admitted Matthew. But he kept asking, and eventually, Marilla let Anne go to the concert. On the day of the concert, Diana did Anne's hair in the new style, and Anne tied Diana's bows in a special way. Anne felt a little sad when she compared her plain black dress and shapeless coat with Diana's pretty green dress and smart jacket. But Anne remembered she had an imagination. 
and she could use it. Early in the evening, Diana's cousins arrived, and they crowded into the big sleigh. As they drove through the snow, there were tinkles of sleigh bells, and the night seemed magical to Anne. The concert was thrilling, too. Only one item on the program failed to interest her, Gilbert Blythe reciting a poem. Anne picked up a book and read it until he finished, but Diana clapped and clapped for the performer. It was 11 o'clock when they got home, and the house was silent. Anne and Diana tiptoed into the guest room. Are you ready for bed? Anne asked. Let's race to the bed. The two girls ran and jumped on the bed in the spare room. And then, something moved under them. There was a gasp and a cry, and somebody said in a muffled voice, <gasps> ah! Oh my goodness! Anne and Diana dashed out of the room and up the stairs. It was cold, and they were shivering. Who was it? What was it? whispered Anne. Oh, Anne, it was Aunt Josephine. She'll be furious, answered Diana. Who's Aunt Josephine? She's my father's aunt, and she lives in Charlottetown. She's really old, 70, and I don't think she was ever young. She's very strict, Diana said. Miss Josephine Berry did not appear at breakfast the next morning. Mrs. Berry smiled kindly at the two girls. Did you have a good time last night? I meant to tell you that Aunt Josephine came and stayed in the guest room, but I was so tired I fell asleep. Diana and Anne just smiled at each other. Anne went home after breakfast, and then later went to Mrs. Lynn's house on an errand. So, you nearly frightened Miss Barry to death last night, said Mrs. Lind. Diana's mother is very upset. Josephine Barry came to stay for a month, but she changed her mind and is leaving tomorrow. And she had promised to pay for Diana's piano lessons, but now she isn't. She thinks Diana is a tomboy. Old Miss Barry is rich, and the Barrys want to keep on her good side. Anne... You should look before you leap, especially into beds. Mrs. Lynde laughed at her own joke, but Anne saw nothing to laugh at. Anne went back and saw Diana. Anne, after you left, Aunt Josephine woke up, and she was so angry. She won't stay, and I don't care, but mother and father do, said Diana. Diana, didn't you say it was my fault? asked Anne. I'm no tattletale, Anne. It was my fault, too. Well, I'm going to tell Aunt Josephine myself, Anne announced. Diana stared. Anne Shirley, why, why, she'll eat you alive. I must, Diana. It was my fault, and I've got to confess. Luckily, I've had practice at confessions. Aunt Josephine was knitting by the fire. Who are you? she demanded. I'm Anne of Green Gables, said the small visitor, and I've come to confess. Confess what? Miss Barry asked. It was my idea that Diana and I jump on your bed. Diana is a very ladylike girl, and it's not fair to blame her, Anne said. Diana jumped too, said Miss Barry. It was just for fun persisted Anne. Diana really wants to learn the piano. If you must be angry, be angry with me. Mrs. Hammond and Mrs. Thomas were always angry at me. I am used to it, and I can endure it better than Diana. The old lady was not angry anymore. In fact, she was interested in this strange red-headed girl. Two girls bounced on me in the middle of the night she said sternly. You don't know what it was like. I don't know, but I can imagine, Anne said eagerly. It must have been very disturbing. Do you have any imagination, Miss Barry? If you do, imagine you are Diana and me. We didn't know there was anybody in the bed, and we nearly died, and we couldn't sleep in the guest room. You're probably used to staying in a guest room, but imagine you're a little orphan girl who's never stayed in a guest room. Miss <laughs> Barry actually laughed.
Diana, listening outside, was relieved. My imagination is a little rusty, Miss Barry said. But sit down and tell me about yourself. I'm very sorry, but I can't, said Anne. I would like to because you seem like an interesting lady. You might even be a kindred spirit, though you don't look like one. I must go home to Miss Marilla Cuthbert. She is a very kind lady who is bringing me up. But before I go, please say you forgive Diana and me. If you come and talk to me sometimes, I will forgive you both, Miss Barry said. That evening, Miss Barry gave Diana a silver bracelet and decided not to return to Charlottetown. I'm staying in Avonlea so I can get acquainted with Anne, she said frankly. She amuses me, and at my age, an amusing person is a rarity. Miss Barry stayed for more than a month, and she and Anne became firm friends. Anne confided to Marilla, Miss Barry was a kindred spirit after all.